I'll try to simplify this, was that I recommend that we discuss next year uh, the uh, capital improvement program earlier on the schedule because I had had some suggestions that I thought others might have suggestions too. So that if we just put CIP discussion on our schedule for next year on a regular meeting. Okay. Sound good? Yes. Um, so on that same pa page here? six, under other right business, here. that first paragraph, Ms. McMillan, and then it says, and Samantha, and I think it should probably say Acting Chair Collins. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Doesn't have me listed as a member present, and I was here for the November meeting. Did you get that? Yep. Got it. Got those changes. Any others? Oh, no. And actually, we don't have a motion, right? Allison, you didn't make a motion. I just so. wanted to say that I wasn't going to vote. Right. Does anybody want to make a motion to approve with the this changes? This person said they can't hear. Okay. You, can, you can't hear? Okay. Is it better now? or? Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Anybody want to make a motion? Yes. Jessica. I'll make a motion to approve the November 9th uh, min meeting minutes with the noted changes. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay, great. Abigail. And any, any other discussion? And we are all here, so um, all those in favor? Aye. And we have two abstaining, probably. Actually, Brian's not voting, so just Allison, right? Great. Thank you. Um, the second item on the agenda is the wetland conditional use permit, new business, 12 Regina Road. <coughs> Anybody here to speak to that? Yes, you can take the microphone and introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Kathleen Vieira. I'm the co-owner of the property at 12 Regina Road. My husband would be here, but he had back surgery on Monday, so he apologizes for not being able to attend. We're asking to put a 10 by 10 shed on the property. Um, from the diagram that I submitted, you can see that most of our property is wetlands buffer. Not a lot of places to put anything other than like right in the middle of the front yard, or right in front of the house. <laughs> um, uh, this shed will be on a 12 by 12 uh, set of rocks, uh, and it is in an area that uh, we think has the least amount of impact on uh, any of the wetlands. We are going to plant some blueberry bushes in that area. Some suggestions around putting it sort of where the wooded area is more, um, and we'll do that in the spring. Sorry, I'm trying to find the application and, uh, here. But. And you had already had the gravel put down? Yeah, before I realized that we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I apologize for that. Thank you. I think a lot of us went out to the site visit on that too. So, do you, um, any questions? Yes. Yeah. The only other thing is that um, we'd like you to put up a couple of uh, signs by the wetland, just saying "Do not cut or disturb." Yeah, we talked about that. Yep. Yeah. Happy to do that. We have oh, a yeah, sample right guys. here. Yeah. You, yeah. You <laughs> mentioned that they were just. I think they just became available, right? Yep. Yes. Yeah, and it's just a very little corner, a couple corners where we've got some wetlands that are right. on our property, but happy to put up signs. Uh, many people that come before us for approvals like this, um, uh, we talked, we asked or suggested to them that they follow organic land management practices because you're so close to wetlands. You mm -hmm. know? And there's a whole book about it, and we can send it to you. And it's called the, the, the uh, Northeast uh, Organic Farmers Association puts together this manual. It's real general. And we just ask that you follow the best practices. And it's really kind of fun. It's educational. And we can send you the link, and it's online. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple of people noticed that we have that zoysia grass out in front of our house. <laughs> um, and it we didn't put anything down. And it did great all season. It stayed green in all the... Um, dryness that we had this year. So we've not been putting down any um, pe uh, pesticides or anything like that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Any other? I think, um, and I, I was just going to mention, having been out to the site, thank you so much for hosting us, um, that 
the area that you have that grassy area going down to the wetland there that mm -hmm. is like kind of direct contact with the water flowing by um, I mean we're, we, I mean I don't know about the other commissioners but it's great it would be great if you could get that down to like a path or something instead of that area um, okay. it's not I don't think we're gonna yeah anybody. that's we, we, we that? just purchased the house in in February and moved exactly. in, in April so we just have kind of been maintaining it um, not changing anything because we were concerned about we knew their wetlands were there and we were afraid to touch anything to be honest with you yeah. um, but yeah we talked about maybe putting down some wild seeds or something like that yeah letting things grow up and yep yeah that, we, that we, we're not it's just my husband and I we not we're not using like that area anyway right. so yeah less to ma maintain for you yep yeah exactly but yeah so any other comments yes Abigail I was gonna bring up that that point and um, and there might have been some um, sort of um, uh, shrub or tall things that maybe were cut down and just might there, um, not right near there we hadn't but um, between like where we walked behind the fence we had cleaned out some of those um, vines that were like real prickly and they were scratching us as we were cutting the grass but we had that's all we had done we hadn't okay. done anything uh, else yeah. and I mean we, we did oh, and I know they're not the same place I, I yeah. know right by there we did limb one of the trees because it was hitting us in the face as we were cutting the grass but we didn't cut any trees down we just limbed it <laughs> it, it was right yeah, at no. eye level yeah no but yeah happy to make that a little bit more wild we have plenty of wild grass that people that didn't come out so happy to make that more wild that's great yeah. Any other questions or comments? No? no? Anybody want to make a motion? Yeah, Samantha. Uh, I'd like to recommend approval for the conditional use permit for 12 Regina Road. Thank you. Second? <coughs> Allison. Second. Discussion? No. Thank you. That's, Thank you that's all great. very much. Yeah. Good luck. I have to vote. We need to vote. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and all those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? You're good. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the State Wetland Bureau Applications New Business, um, Marcy Street, Prescott Park. Somebody here to speak to that? Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Joseph Almeida. I'm the Facilities Manager for the City of Portsmouth. Uh, we're here um, to present to you the uh, Prescott Park Phase 1A improvements. Um, many of you were at the uh, site walk last week in the rain. Thank you and for coming out on such a soggy day. Um, as most of you probably know, as the whole community knows, we have um, been going through um, a lot of design and a lot of um, um, master planning for um, Prescott Park. Uh, it's a very large project, multi-phase project that will take place over, over years. This uh, first piece um, has been through other land use boards, including the HTC. Um, I believe it's clearly defined in the packet that was provided to you. Um, um, so I would actually just gonna, I'm gonna step aside and allow my um, consultants to present the project in a, in a, in a more detailed way. Uh, Cassie, Bethany, and uh, Devin Herrick are with uh, Weston Sampson. I believe you met them on the walkthrough, so. Um, hopefully you've all had a chance to look closer at the drawings and um, give them any questions you might have. Thank you. I'm trying to get the drawing up right now. I'm just going to take off my mask just for talking. And thank you for your time. Um, I'll start the conversation, then I'll pass it to Devin to go through impact numbers, and then I'll follow up at the end. <coughs> are the, oh, Peter, are you... I'll wait for right you. Yeah, it's a big, big packet. Not technical difficulties, just personal difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, look at that board back. Just... Sorry about this. Yeah, that's what I mean. Totally unnecessary expense. It looks like stages. Stages <laughs> stage going over here. I don't know. I don't know pops up in mind here. The stage that was here is now. Yeah. Be there. Wow, it's cool. 
all these. Okay. It goes on forever. What? No, they have all these bookmarks in it. I guess that's it. Card in. Does that mean these we do, we do have the slides on a USB okay. if that's helpful. Do you? If you want, if you'd rather run that. That'd be better. Seven. Do you have the USB available? None of that's of happening. It's not, that, not that it matters, but in this like one, within this it, one. Yeah. Okay. It's not bookmark within it. Does this look like they're moving the gardens here? Hmm? Does the bookmark it itself are. automatically, or is Usually. that something that has so to be done? Have to do it. They have, they have these ones. That's going to be it. Yeah. So that would be better. Okay. All right. Well. USB. Oh, here we go. I got it. You have it? Yeah. I have it. <laughs> Look like I have it. Excellent. Okay, so, so um, one of the questions that came up last time was just to provide some con uh, at our site visit was to provide some context. Um, and so I'll go through the phase 1A scope of work in the, lar the broader master plan setting. Uh, Devin, as mentioned, we'll go through impact numbers, I'll go through schedule, and then we'll open it up for your questions. Next slide. So we completed the master plan in 2017 and moved into an enabling engineering phase thereafter. Part of that study was a, a deep dive into the resiliency challenges, the stormwater impacts and sea level rise impacts on Prescott Park uh, and the surrounding neighborhoods. So we looked at Strawberry Bank and uh, the South End as well. And we found that there were some significant improvements that we could make within the design of the master plan to make improvements more broadly within the neighborhood. And so this slide, although small, kind of the high level idea is that there are several interventions across the entire park that we'll make. And uh, from this, we found we rejiggered our phasing plan and really focused on the center of the park meaning the Shaw and the Sheaf, the Water Street area and the Performance Lawn as where a bulk of those resiliency interventions would be happening. And so we wanted to do those first to make the most impact as soon as possible. Um, and so this was the driver to develop our phase one area. And now we've tightened up that phase one area to a phase one area, one A area that I'll share in a moment. Next slide. Um, so as you know, uh, Prescott Park is in a downtown, um, po highly populated park, um, gets tons of daily use. It's home to the arts festival. And so this core of the park uh, sees a lot of foot traffic. It sees so much use and we are have been working with the arts festival to uh, look at where the stage is located and, and where it needs to move to, how we deal with trailers uh, and where the trailers would move to through these improvements and things like that. And we've honed this phase 1A area in the solid line here um, that you can see that's wrapped around Water Street and really connects the sheaf down to the, uh, the Shaw down to the sheaf at the water. Um, our improvements there will it, will include uh, actually lifting and moving the Shaw building so that it's moved closer to Water Street. That's the really the, the biggest move we're, we're doing here where we're protecting that cultural asset that's uh, important to the city and, and uh, culturally important and um, a historically significant building. We're also raising Water Street, uh, as we talked about in the site walk, to an elevation that will meet that new elevation for the Shaw, so it'll read as one complete plane. Uh, we are installing preferential flood pathway stormwater infrastructure underneath Water Street so that uh, we can start to capture that stormwater and flooding uh, that's happening on site now. 
uh, we're upgrading structures, we're adding tide gates to uh, that new line that's going in, and we're, jump we're making upgrades to the parking lot um, by proxy of doing this work. We'll tie the, the new grading that's elevated up three and a half feet down into the existing fabric of the park, and so it'll feel like a seamless new connection within the space. And you can see the dashed yellow line was indicating a larger phase one scope that we'll do next, but we've um, tightened up the scope for now uh, to match our funding availability. So next slide. <clears throat> I'll just get a little bit into lifting and moving the Shaw and the reasoning behind it. So in the phase one Shaw building goals, we are um, demolishing the garage and lean-to. That's the first building and the foremost, and then the mid middle building, then the Shaw is the largest building, the three-story building in the, the background of this image. We will relocate that Shaw um, out of the fl current flood zone and allow for a future addition within that, I guess, garage and lean-to space. Um, and we'll do a, form, a full exterior renovation to that building that, uh, based on our investigations on site and looking into the building through this phase one design process, we found uh, really needs that work done. So that work was presented to the HDC and we received full approval for that. Next slide. So today, this uh, oblique image shows what the conditions are today. You can see the sheaf out in the water, uh, the garage lean to in the Shaw, and then the a setup of the Prescott Park Arts Festival stage and the trailer uh, setup backup stage situation behind, just to give people a sense. Next slide. And so just to reiterate, we are removing those buildings and we're lifting and moving the Shaw closer to the sheaf. In the phase one condition, we will leave the, the stage and the, the trailer setup will, ha will stay in its current location. We're not making any adjustments to that area of the park at the moment. Next slide. And then once this work is complete after phase 1A, this, we'd like to lift and move the stage back and so that it's in line with the Shaw building and so that we can really open up the park and make it feel more connected and less dis disjointed and make use of that space that the stage currently occupies. Next slide. Ultimately, we'll build a, a bowl or a performance lawn space that will double as above ground flood storage during a, a storm surge. And it'll also be a spectator seating area, an overflow seating area. Um, it'll be centered on the stage. It'll become a really nice civic open space within the park. So that's the overall vision um, with the addition added and the stage there, um, just to give folks a sense, but that's not what's slated for the moment. Um, that's just ultimately our goal. <coughs> Next slide. So I'll pass it to Devin to talk specifically about um, the impacts on this phase one area. Thank you, Cassie. Uh, Devin Herrick, I'm a certified wetland scientist with Weston and Sampson. So I'll speak with you briefly about some of the impacts that went into the New Hampshire DES major impact application as it was submitted. So we're looking at three different what we'll term resource areas for the time being within Prescott Park, um, which require permitting. We have our tidal waters to start with, the Piscataqua River. Within the Piscataqua, we're looking at 14 square feet of permanent impact. That permanent impact is for a new outfall that's necessary in order to support some of the utility work that will be going in underwater street. We also have the perennial stream bank, again, for the Piscataqua. For permanent impact, we're looking at 38 linear feet. And what that accounts for is for the new vertical addition that will go on the side of the sheaf building. Um, we, made, we pointed it out on the sidewalk. There's a short concrete wall that's currently existing adjacent to the sheaf. 
When the uh, land around it is raised, we need to raise that wall up in order to meet the new grades that will be occurring. So the wall will remain in its same location, same configuration. It just needs to get a little higher in order to meet the new grades that will be coming in. We'll also be looking at 2021 linear feet of temporary impact. That breaks down to 771 linear feet of impact for vegetation removal along the wall. That's necessary because the wall needs repairs to the mortar. Much of it has cracked out and it needs to be resurfaced in that way in order to maintain its integrity. So we'll be looking to remove vegetation between the top of bank and the highest observable tide line. Um, it will be done either by the upland or by boats. There will be no dewatering proposed as part of this project. We did speak with both New Hampshire DES and the Army Corps regarding these impacts. Um, they did not feel that any sort of mitigation is necessary because we did do some research into kind of two of the species that most commonly make up the seaweed that's along these walls. Um, in particular, we have our bladder racks and our sea lettuce. They have such a rapid regrowth rate that we don't have concerns about it being able to reseed itself very quickly in the same area. Um, we did look into whether there were any opportunities to maybe save that material and re-put it onto the same locations. But the Piscataqua River, it just it moves too quickly and the wave impacts from the boats that go by, it's just not a good opportunity for that, unfortunately. So we expect to see regrowth in a very quick fashion. Um, regrowth does depend a bit on uh, ocean temperatures. So I can't say exactly what the regrowth rate would be, but we do expect it to regrow very rapidly. We also have 479 linear feet of impact to account for shifting the granite blocks that are on top of the wall. On our site walk, you may have observed there's several granite blocks that are quite out of place. Um, they pose a bit of a hazard, so we're proposing to lift those up, realign and put them back, same location, same blocks. Uh, we also have, let's see, oh, 771 linear square feet of repointing and spot repairs. That occurs along the same locations as the vegetation removal along the wall. So that is your cumulative 2021 linear feet of impact. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention about the tidal waters is that DES did feel that that 14 square feet um, would be subject to mitigation. And so that is being proposed for in Luffy. For the developed tidal buffer zone, we're looking for a cumulative total of 22,387 square feet. That accounts for all the regrading, the relocation of the structures and the proposed walkways with an additional 5,278 square feet of impact. Those are for areas um, that have the existing walkways, roadways, a lawn to lawn conversion with no great change. The next slide, please. We also wanted to bring this slide up because a few folks had questions about impervious area. Um, as part of the submission, there were also five shoreland applications that went in because this section of Prescott Park is made up of five lots. And so each one requires its own submission. But if you look here, um, we're actually seeing a cumulative reduction in impervious area as a result of this project. With that, I'm gonna turn it back to Cassie for the time being, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any move to the next slide so this is the last slide and i'll just end on overall schedule and i realize this is very small to see um, but essentially we have submitted uh, we have done uh, investigatory work geotech uh, geotechnical boring stormwater test pits uh, and worked on our construction construction documents to a 90 percent complete level and submitted those as a permitting set to the state and that's the package that you received. Uh, we are um, in the review period for the state um, through the permits that Devin mentioned and also through the DHR for the moving of the Shaw. Uh, we expect that we'll have comments and responses back from them by the end of January, beginning of February. Um, at which time we'll respond to comments and continue um, to, to secure those permits. Um, then the project will go before the council and governors because we'll be um, with, the, with the new preferential uh, line, we'll be below the high water line. Um, and, and then we'll continue thereafter um, 
with hopefully approved permits to move forward, we'll finalize the documents and we're hoping to be out to bid by the middle to end of next year, so at the beginning of fall, so that we can have a contractor on board and be able to start construction by uh, early part of 2024. So with that, I'll pass it to the commission to field any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Allison. Yes, I, I have a few questions. Um, one is how much input has the public had on this particular plan? The public input process has been extensive since 2016 when the master plan was completed. We have a committee that's formed was formed through the master plan. We had an implementation committee formed that um, was chaired by Tom Watson and that has continued on through our process and so at every time where there's where we've needed a decision or uh, we've needed to progress the project we've met with that committee and so I I've indicated some of those um, but we haven't included the whole schedule but we've had countless meetings with that group um, and we had dedicated public engagement during the master plan dedicated public engagement during the implementation phase and so the engagement has been significant um, and then we've engaged with boards where there's been an opportunity for public comment as well uh, it's just confusing to me because when you um, when we were talking the other day there was a, a very large tree and you were talking about pouring concrete and then putting a brick walkway over it and yet in the diagram that's on page 42 um, which is the overall plan um, it seems like that walkway isn't there and that tree isn't there and I'm just wondering why you would pour concrete and put a brick walkway on it when ultimately it's not going to be in the final plan I'm not sure which one you're referring to um, closer to the water so it was uh, no there's a do you have a, a current plan um, it was page 42. Yeah. It, the the tree. Mm. Future impacts right now. it doesn't show the trees, though. Can we go to that? Can we go to the sheet that shows the entire? Oh, sorry, trying. It looks like you're trying to. Now. I'm trying. I'll pull it up. It's in the packet on page 42. Oh, that's my own. And Peter, in the back of the presentation that you just had up, there was a full plan set, just in case detailed questions For came up. Sheet number you had, right? Allison? Allison, are you looking at this? I'm looking at this, and I'm I'm looking at it, and, and lower I'm corner seeing... is there a sheet number? Oh, that plan. Yeah. Is that the tree? No, I'm I'm looking at that one, and I'm saying that the tree is not there, and the walkway that they're talking about pouring isn't, concrete isn't for is not there. We no, that one's right by the water. Peter, could I approach? This tree is not yeah, by the water. Right. Allison, that one. This is current. Yes. You can pull it up. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think this is the tree we were speaking of when we were out on site. Is that the tree you're referring to? It might be. That guy. Yeah, I thought maybe that was that's it. it. I thought that's it. Yeah, that's, that's here. Okay. Uh, but the thing is, the walkway isn't in the same position that you were talking about pouring yeah, concrete and putting. Back there yeah. So they can yeah. yeah. If you can point to this. Yeah, point to it. <laughs> So the tree that we're talking about is the one uh, inside the bowl on the Piscataqua side, correct? Yes. So in both the temporary walkway that needs to connect from our new path to an existing path and this master plan condition, we're not impacting that tree. I mean, yeah. we're not, we should not be going in the drip line. And the grading doesn't even, doesn't that, That's good, that I'm, gl tree. I'm glad about that, but I'm, I'm thinking about the walkway and like I was very concerned that you were making it impervious um, by pouring the concrete and then you're going to set bricks on it and you were saying well that was to make it last longer but the thing is that it doesn't look like it's the same pathway that we're seeing here because that pathway went right to Water Street and it's this does not go to Water Street anymore the pathway that's by this tree so in the phase 1a since we're doing this sliver but we're also trying to negotiate a larger master plan vision 
there are a few temporary connections we have to make and the one that you're talking about is a temporary pathway that runs from the, the stretch of brick along the Piscataqua that's going to be permanent to uh, where the the nose of like a you have a oh I see yeah. where the stage that's is that's yeah that on hold at the top the top button. oh oh I see so this pathway right here yeah we have to connect to this existing pathway right here it's more or less existing right the trouble is that we're looking at a master plan view right now but we're actually tying into an existing park um, and so we we have those plans but this is drawn on the master plan but we're making this connection here it's a little bit of a different configuration because it's not that exact layout that the master plan is going to be it's just going to be an a pervious pathway connection that more or less follows this alignment um, but just as a phase one temporary connection to allow people to move from this new pathway over to here well if it's temporary that's why I'm wondering why you have to pour concrete we're not pouring concrete okay you're not that's, under that one the concrete that will be poured is under this permanent pathway okay and then the temporary connection will be pervious okay that's what I wanted to find out about um, and then the other thing is we had a little discussion about um, the fact that there's going to be um, uh, an area where the lawn is a long sloping lawn um, will exist along the entire length of the phase one work this area right here yeah and so I'm wondering how long is that long going to be there so Joe do you want to, that's really comes down to funding ultimately yeah the, the following phases will address that area in a permanent way and as of right now um, um, there is no exact time frame on that so it could be years could be okay yep. because that was where we had discussed potentially putting in a pollinator mm -hmm. uh, garden instead of doing a lawn and I'm wondering if that's a possibility because I mean you know there's a lot of lawn there and it would be nice to decrease some of it with were, were something you, like a pollinator garden so in your description of that area you 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 mentioned correctly because we've explained it that there's going to be a kind of a sloping berm that runs a full length of it runs the the sloping berm is going to run you know the full length of from where Shaw is relocated you know, all the way down um, are you simply referring to just the berm or were you were you suggesting we get out into the lawn area? yeah no I was just talking about the part that like <clears throat> you're talking about what is going to need to be reseeded any, any no. soil that you don't want to leave bare no. and I was thinking that as long as you've got it why not put in you know like a wildflower pollinator garden or something instead of doing that and ultimately I think that having something like that permanently somewhere within this plan would be a good idea but at any rate I think that just even a temporary covering putting something like that would be mm. beneficial Peter there's a slide if you don't mind skipping down to where we show the trailers moved back yep just uh, before we're yep right there um, so we I think it's an interesting idea I'm not sure it, it works in this particular setting for this particular park um, we're in a downtown setting the amount of foot traffic that we have moving through the park um, and then supporting the arts festival and allowing us to move this stage back into that space will allow that park to really open up and uh, spectators will be able to move into that lawn space and you that'll be if it's open clean lawn I think it'll be a better use of that space than a meadow which I, I worry would be successful given the amount of people like the tens of thousands of people that come into that space to to just go to a show um, let alone the daily use that's moving through that space well I'm, I'm not saying make that permanent because obviously you're talking about moving the trailer to the <coughs> stage but what I'm saying is that it may be years that this might be open and so instead of having it be lawn if you're not moving anything into it right now why not plant a pollinator garden or plant something that doesn't need the care and maintenance that the majority of lawn need 
hear your point. I'm not sure what more to add to that. There. Jess? Um, I'm just curious, are you, because it could be years after this initial phase happens, are you concerned about what is currently the stage area flooding? Like, I know you're going to try to direct stormwater as best you can, but water's going to go where it wants to go. So if you have a sloping lawn with an elevated road, it seems like that current stage area could wind up being in a puddle. Do you, have you? The current stage area does flood currently. Yeah. And so the, the future phase when we're able to do it would it really lean into that idea of creating this bowl in a temporary condition. I think it'll happen anyway. And now a stage won't be sitting in there, collect, like sitting in wet feet during a storm surge. So I think that improvement alone of moving it back and elevating it will be a, a good thing. And then, and then, of course, in this phase itself, there's there's a lot of work beneath the surface that addresses stormwater, um, which is shown on the uh, resiliency in, in, uh, intervention sheet. Um, we're upsizing a lot of the um, uh, one of the outflows uh, in, in a very significant way, right in this immediate area. We're adding a second one. Um, which is why we're going to be disturbing the, you know, the seaweed. So the, the stormwater is, is significantly, at the conclusion of phase 1A, um, improved the management of that. Okay. And I know that's not relevant to what you're doing right now, but when you move this stage, are you making it bigger? What's happening to... So we're going to keep the current setup for the stage. Right, right, but in the, when you get to the next the, phase and you move it, is we're, it? We're, recon, we're considering options for a future stage, but it's not just designed or considered anything other than what's currently there okay. at the moment. And my final question to you, and I, I, I ask you the expert, um, this just seems like a really good opportunity you know, Portsmouth's on the brink of creating a climate action plan. Like, are there more innovative ways that we can do some of this stuff? Like, especially without just laying down slabs of concrete that don't seem very, you know, you know I don't know. Have those options been considered? Are there other things like that? It just, I would hate for us to just kind of do those things the way we usually do them you know, when we're doing all this work to preserve and protect and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't discount the, the creativity that went in, into this multi-pronged resiliency approach. Like this alone, I've been speaking about it to, I went down to Philly to talk about it. It's uh, people are learning from Portsmouth just on Prescott Park and what we're doing in this approach. So the fact that we've woven we looked at a myriad of different resiliency strategies and came up with this five-pronged approach that works together to make the best improvement possible for this context. I think the, the creativity involved in this is, is astounding and should be looked at as an exemplar, uh, an example of, of what other cities should be doing. Um, so, so I think that's one thing. Um, and then in terms of material selections, um, we were trying to be as, I think we've, we've looked at the, the regulations and how we can do better. And um, so, so we are proposing permeable pavements in certain places where, where it needs to happen. Um, we're ba balancing maintenance concerns and constructability. Um, so, so I think we're trying our best and trying to negotiate all of the, the different considerations and challenges that come along with that. But I appreciate that point. Other questions, <clears throat> comments? Yes, Lynn. I guess while we're talking about kind of the, the longer term vision for the park, I'm, I have kind of two questions. One, I'm curious about the involvement with Strawberry Bank and like what that looks like. And I, I know that they've got also some like kind of innovative things that they're considering yeah. long term. <clears throat> they do. Uh, we do meet with Strawberry Bank. We met as recently as last week with them. Um, to be sure that um, what we're doing um, can align with what they're doing, 
um, and we have great communication with them and look and give them access to all of our studies and vice versa. So um, they are, as you know, uh, very impacted. This 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 location that we're working in um, truly is it, it's 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 a critical spot for us to correct, and it affects them. It affects the whole neighborhood. And uh, um, long answer to a uh, to your question, but we're we are very much in communication with them. I heard like a, a rumor, and maybe this is just like a, I don't know all the details, but that they were, you know, right, there used to be water flowing down Water Street, yeah. right? It used to be water. Right. Um, <clears throat> so what you're proposing is, you know, elevating it and kind of reinforcing it. And I guess I, I thought that Strawberry Bank was considering kind of like recreating some water features, you know, where the Puddle Duck skating rink is. Yeah, I don't want to speak for them and yeah. blow, blow any surprises they might be <laughs> they right. might, or un wanting to unveil. But, yeah, they're, they're working on a very exciting... Um, aesthetically, their project is very exciting as well, um, and um, I, I wasn't aware that the uh, when, when I looked at their data that the um, the water used to make its way all the way to South Mill Pond, right? Yeah. Um, which was astounding. And some of the studies that we've had um, we've had done for this project um, show you know data projected out um, 50 to 100 years, and it shows what the impact will be. And it's all on the city's website; anyone can look at it. It's it's um, it's very informative and, and you know shocking to see, um, but um, the amount of water that uh, wants to come into this spot, where it came in before, it just wants to come back, and um, we're just trying to manage it as best we can. Yeah. Yeah, so and I'd add, I'd add to that too. Yeah, and talking with Strawberry Bank, it, although they're elevating that area, they're bringing it up to the grade of a piece of property that's already there, and adding additional stormwater connections that'll be higher up in the the outfall, the second outfall they're adding here which allows water to flow where it can't right now because it's so low and the flood the flapper gate or the tide gate will stop that but the higher it'll be a little bit higher the second one so they'll have some but there this is really the ground zero in Portsmouth in terms of stormwater right. and, <clears throat> and flooding so there's going to be a lot of innovative strategies I think what they're doing is innovative what strawberry banks innovate doing is innovative but we are working really closely with them and trying to find solutions but there's no there's no silver bullet that's for sure. They showed us an image, uh, Peter, you saw it, with the, the, the image of, it was a hurricane in 1991, I don't remember the name of the hurricane. Yeah. But it showed their Bob, entire green, the entire green where the skating rink, it was all under a lot of water, yeah. a mm -hmm. lot of water. It was, a, it was a lake all the way up to, to, is that Washington Street? Yeah, and they have, yeah. so we have the huge rainfall events and then coastal flooding events in a nor'easter that, you know, Water's gonna water's gonna sit here at times. There's gonna that's just gonna be a fact of life. But I think the fact that it's not a critical facility, that what they're looking at with this performance lawn area in the future, is, or or other ideas to store water and then ways to keep water out, are gonna be you know things that we're gonna need to look at as models and see how we do. But mm -hmm. there's also some stormwater work going on too to track some of that. Yeah, it's not just keeping water out. It's okay. also accommodating water and. Like accepting the fact that water will come in and how can we put it in a place and allow it to do its thing um, so that it, it doesn't impact the use of the park and such things. And to clarify, you just recently started talking to them? No. No, we've been no. sharing, we, we, we've, had a, we've had a recent formal meeting with them, all of us around the table. Um, but um, we've, been, we've been providing them with, with data that we have been producing. Um, but most re our most recent meeting was, boy, I want to say it was, is it last Monday? week or was it earlier this week? it was Monday. Week? Uh, was it Monday? I'm Tuesday. losing, yeah. yeah. Losing yeah. Time. It's very recent. It's been a year. Recent. Yeah, it's been years. I think they were involved in the master planning effort as well. Yeah. And they have an ongoing planning effort going that we're involved with. So we have been talking and yeah. so this doesn't interfere with their idea of kind of, <clears throat> doesn't I guess interfere. I thought there was even going to be I mean, tidal flows in Discovery no. Bank, but... <clears throat> right. It doesn't like this, this would block it, that. It actually, yeah, hopefully it helps it, but I think there's yeah. going to have to be some coordination as they move forward in their right. process. And, you know, everybody talks about, well, maybe just opening up Puddle Dock again, but that's not really realistic in the downtown, and it's not going to help. It's just going to allow water to go further in. So yeah, this is these are ways, I mean, this plan has ways to accommodate some of the stormwater. But. Well, what we feel will help them in a very significant way is the improvements we're making to the, the you know the pipe sizing and where yep. it's going. And so when their when their water reaches Marcy Street, it will find our new pipes, um, and, and it'll it'll drain it much faster for them. Yeah, and they're working on dealing with their water. Yeah, it's 
interesting, super interesting. And then can I ask one more question? Sorry. Um, just again, in terms of the long-term vision, I'm, I'm super curious about the, the boardwalk. And does that function as kind of a barrier or is it just an, like a recreational access point? Yeah, I think the intention behind that was to attenuate wave action as mm -hmm. kind of one of the drivers ultimately and try to reduce the load that's coming onto the park proper. Um, but it also functions as a recreational asset too. That would be a new use. Yes. So it would go into the water, but maybe not all the way down? Is that? It's, it's not designed yet. I don't know if it yeah. would touch the ground or if it would be cantilevered or what. Abigail? My question was just back to what we were talking about just before that question. Um, no, that's fine. I mean, you can, it made sense. Um, but with all the elevation changes, um, and, and it, this has to do with, you know, Strawberry Bank and everything, and you guys are working with them, um, but uh, the displacement of the water by raising up the grade, is there any displacement that's happening that will be sent out or, or is everything that would have landed on that spot when it was low still going to be collected um, despite the, anyway, you know what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, all the, the water, the way that it, it travels through the site will be collected in the, the two drain, the structures that Joe is just speaking of in Marcy Street and then they'll be um, piped down underneath Water Street, actually, in a larger drain than right. what they, we have okay. now, um, back out to the river. And before it gets to the river, it'll be treated and cleaned and all the things that need to happen um, so that it'll be coming back into the river better than it came onto the site. Yeah. I, I thought you guys had talked about that. I just wanted to um, confirm. Okay. Other questions? And I, I was just going to clarify too on the parking lot that's happening in this phase, that parking areas, you're changing the. Yeah, right now, you know, people park in parallel and it creates like a double wide barrier through the park. Um, so in this design, we've got a, a driveway that's thinned up and then people will actually be able to park head in at a 90 degree. And so we're shortening that distance that actually is visually cars. Um, and that will be permeable asphalt, the actual parking area. Um, and then uh, it'll be the more or less the same number of spaces. It'll just be in a tighter zone within the park. And when you say it's a permeable area, if it wasn't permeable, you'd be adding more impervious surface, is that, or is it just kind of quid? It's like a moving of asphalt. So when you do it, I didn't see any kind of maintenance plan in there, and I know it would be the city probably maintaining it, but correct. can you add a maintenance plan to that of maintaining it appropriately for pervious pavement? Um, yeah, um, and I, I don't want to speak out of term, but the city, I assume, has permeable right. asphalt in okay. other Several locations. Um, it's a vacuuming process that they do semi-annually to clear that out. I'm sure you've seen, you know, projects come before you with that aspect. Yeah. And I'm so speaking sure. about winter maintenance too, because um, to make sure that they maintain it properly for winter maintenance. Absolutely. Especially if it's new and it hasn't cured for a while, that first year is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. um, I had other questions too about the tide gate. Um, so you guys, it's a great job of explaining it in the application. Um, but I'm wondering how that impacts aquatic life at all, if there's that potential. Um, hmm. It's a, what is it, a 36 inch culvert or? Um, I believe there's a 32, I believe, we're upsizing. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's by the time it makes it, I'm, I'm not sure of the, it. The tide gate is fitted to that line. And to we're, this one. Yeah, yeah, and we're going from 24 mm. to 36 inch. Um, I'm not the, sure the answer on the aquatic life. Do you know, Devin? Um, again, I'm not the engineer, but I did ask them a few questions when they were designing it. It's my understanding that the tide gate will only allow water to go out and uh, the salty brackish water cannot come back in. Um, that's how it was meant to function so that that storm water can leave the site and not back up. So it would be my understanding that there wouldn't be much in the way of impact to aquatic life because in theory it shouldn't be able to get 
back in in that way. Okay, thank you. And I had a question about the drawings and how it looks for the flared area where the pipe comes out. That um, <clears throat> it looks like that flared area goes right to the edge of whatever you have for rock or riprap there. Yeah, so we observe the the stone or vetment that's mortared in, and so the the pipe will come through that, and the pipe will flare out and sit at that edge. Um, so it'll be an opening in the wall essentially. Will be there any anywhere beyond that flare to avoid erosion? Anything in there? Any kind of? Um, I'm not so the the wall itself is a hardened wall. I'm not sure it would erode. Um, very large riprap. It's very the wall is made up of as, as you might already know. They're very large um, riprap stones. And I believe our detail has has like a stone apron perhaps I'd have to check back at that detail but there should be some accommodation for the actual uh, bottom of the river bed okay for any it's, erosion issues okay I didn't see it in the diagram so thank you any other <laughs> questions or comments so I, I wanted to ask to speak to and maybe um, the question about the pollinator garden a little bit. There, there doesn't seem to be any kind of plantings other than grass. So, I mean, are there any other opportunities that you guys can temporarily put things in or maybe in well, the bigger scheme of things? Make well, of course, in the bigger scheme of things, there are several gardens that are being replanted in the, in the overall you know, master plan. If you, if you look at yeah, this image, there's opportunities for to specify the gardens in, in you know the rest of the site for sure. There's a there's a very significant amount of, of um, yeah the Hovey Fountain area and then the formal gardens as well. And you were just starting to point out the tri trial gardens as well. Yeah. Those were the zones that we were and we obviously haven't thought about plants at this stage, so we can we can do a pollinator focused planting um, for those. Um, but the core of the park, that's really spectator audience zone, and so we were hoping to keep that open. Yes. I can just kind of building on the, that kind of line of questioning, um, just as somebody who, like, takes kids to the shows at Prescott Park, you know, daytime shows when it's hot, <laughs> trees are fantastic, um, and just in the really, really, Rejiggering of the the stage just to kind of voice that request and it would also meet some of these climate um, yeah. goals um, I just thought of one other thing around um, So planting wise we're also there's it's hard to see here, but like a there's like a Yellowish tinge to the rendering in certain areas. So there's there's some of that along this pier and then along these edges as well and then that is intended to be like a, a pollinator or like a meadow type in, intervention. Um, so that's planned for future. And then within this area where we were talking about wave attenuation before, I think the idea in the master plan had always been to also use plants, like a living shoreline type application to help attenuate the waves. Um, so we have hard seawall, you know, you see it the whole edge right now is currently hard seawall and so that planting could also be native aquatic species that would help slow water down and such and provide more habitat uh, for 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 those areas that currently don't have any so and it's just why you guys are here and you can respond i just was going to say that makes me think of the fact that you didn't include the conservation commission in on your planning up to this point and, and I'm not sure about the planning board, but we would like to participate from now on um, because this kind of dialogue is really important and we don't know all of this, but we do know what we think is important. And I, I think you, you would really, it would be very valuable for all of us to participate in that. Absolutely. We welcome it. On a formal basis at some point from now on because there's a lot going on. Yeah, there could be some fun, like, you know, interpretation, like education stuff that we could maybe help contribute yeah. to, right? Like, it's a really lovely place to, like, 
do a little bit of teaching about what does good buffer plantings look like and why are they important or even going right down to the shoreline edge, there could be some fun stuff with the rocks and the seaweed. <laughs> yeah, and needless to say, we, we're looking forward to implementing the rest of it and getting to that place where we, where we yeah. can do that collaboratively for sure. It's, uh, it's an exciting project. Mm -hmm. Just where we're trying to get this little piece, one piece started and get the ball rolling. And there's a com composting bins there that I guess you're gonna have to remove which um, okay. was an educational piece yeah. originally yeah. back in the 90s yeah. that we put up. And so that's something that, you know, you could incorporate things like that in there too. So, any other comments or questions? Yes, Evan? Yeah, I just had a comment sort of following up on what you guys have said. It's like when I was there the other day, I was thinking, you know, for the site walk, I was thinking it would be really fun if this, the layout became something into the future as opposed to this sort of remnant of old parks, um, which you it's all touching on, you know, pollinator gardens and, and stuff that goes, you know, natural stuff that goes down to the shoreline and sort of the education thing, but just sort of, sort of, you know, maybe an idea of what our park should look like going forward, not um, so much of a, uh, thing to the you know a salute to the past because the past is just a lot of cut lawns so um, but anyway so I just wanted to put two cents in there for show there more support for that idea so anyway that's thank you yeah. anybody want to make a motion yeah. another question <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm, I'm also curious about the the rocks right that have the the seaweed on them um, what is happening to those rocks? Are they getting reused or? It's so a, a part of this effort is since we're working in this zone of Water Street, we're going to repair the seawall um, in our working area. And so we'll be pulling out the mortar and essentially repointing the wall in certain areas and fixing the blocks. That's what Devin had mentioned were the in those impact areas. Um, and so in order to do that work, that aquatic those aquatic plants would need to be removed. Um, and and we've vetted the idea of, of removing them, but you know, do we have to replace them? And um, Army Corps and the state seem to agree that they're fast growing enough and they're not uh, endangered species or anything. And so the, it wasn't a concern. So you're reusing the rocks, but in order to do the, like, the upgrade, you have to It's remove. all the same rocks, okay. it's just new, okay. and repointing at work. Right. Do they do the rocks even stay in the place and it's just the mortar you're taking out and exactly replacing? right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, I didn't use my hand. So I, would it, would we ask now if there's anybody from the public or I don't know if there's anybody from the public that wanted to speak on this, if there's no other questions. Thank you very much. Elizabeth Bradder, property owner, 159 McDonough Street. I'm sorry that I'm passing out what I'm going to say to you is because I normally would have written a letter, but I finished reading the 492 pages at 3 o'clock. <laughs> so um, needless to say, what I wrote may not be as organized as I like to be, but um, I'm going to present it anyway. I was hoping that somebody could find the picture of the flood zone. I, do you have it in your? It's thing? in our plan zone. Can you tell us where that is? Okay, so all of the numbers are he on here are from the packet. It's because yeah, I. Those cause two slides, this one and the next one, are existing to propose. Okay, you don't have the actual flood zone in color, though. It's not noted on the plan. Okay, all right. So, page 336 in our packet, so we'll just pull it up. If you, yeah, it's, p it's page 73 in your packet if you guys have the packet. So, I. We, I just wanted to give you a quick history, which you probably already know, that in 1930, Josephine and Mary Prescott bought the land along Mar Marcy Street, which was formerly called Water Street, to clean up the area and fill it with gardens. It was donated to the city of Portsmouth in 1954. Phase one is proposed to be reviewed today and can be found on page 482 
of the application. So pretty much you have to read the whole thing to find it. It is shown as updating utilities, raising and resurfacing of Water Street, the removal of the Shaw Garage and lean-to, adding a new foundation and moving the Shaw Building, seating the grade changes and um, repairing this old seawall. It was my understanding that the moving of the stage was not part of this. It was part of one of one B, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I would like to point out some observations I made in reading all of this lovely stuff. First on page 168 to 188 is the delineation of wetlands report, and this area is considered a developed area. Plantings along the seawall would help in, in any instance um, to uptake water, control runoff, and to buffer from waves and erosion. And they're talking about, when they talk about plantings along the seawall, they're talking about on the inside not on the water side. The water side there is pretty deep. It would be difficult to put plantings along some of the area in phase one. Sadly, as many of you noted, um, there is no proposal of restoration or natural gardens along the seawall. It's just grass and sidewalks. Um, please consider the actual flood zone, which is on page 23, I'm sorry, 73 of the packet. It's elevation eight. And in, it includes the seating and stage areas for the Prescott Parts Arts Festival, all of Water Street, and all of Strawberry Bank. As a matter of fact, if we do not do anything, um, Pleasant Street will be waterfront property. In the summary of the stormwater modeling on page three, which happens up between page 317 and 322, it shows a height increase of just a little above eight feet. So the Amica um, insurance states that in AT, AE flood zones are areas that present a 1% annual chance of flooding and a 26% chance over a 30-year mortgage, which is according to FEMA. But what's important in here is that the elevation of the lowest floor in a structure must be at or above the zone's flood base. According to the application that was presented, the Sheaf Warehouse is not of concern, although when you look at it, it does seem to be just barely, ab does not seem to be above elevation of eight feet. Stormwater basins, culverts, and drainage are wonderful, but when it rains or snows, the wind determines where the water grows, not the engineers. Another area of concern is that the coastal modeling report on page 359 states, and I put a copy of it at the very end, the actual quote, in using the mean confidence interval, there is a, there is a known 50% change in the surge water level and that could be higher than what is predicted. In other words, using the base conditions and the 96, ran, and 96 random tides would have provide, provided a 95% percentile of confidence in the intervals. So I just have concerns about that. If you bring up page 483, that's where the actual work being done is shown and it shows where the tidal zones are. It makes sense to raise Water Street and update the utilities as needed. The question is, and some of you brought this up, is when Water Street is raised, in other words, at the end of phase 1A and the slope is graded, how much of the storm water will run off into the garden side of Prescott Park or end Marcy Street. Water Street is being raised and filled will likely cause a slower infiltration rate than what's there now due to the height and also the pervious payment. Because when, right now you have to remember that the water runs onto Water Street over the embankment and it in, and which inadvert, Water Street acts as a culvert and it flows into the storm water basins that are there and on Marcy Street because it is all pervious. It is all impervious surface. But when you add pervious surface, it slows down how fast the water is absorbed. absorbed sorry. To me, it does not make sense at all to move the Shaw Building from what seems to be its original location, looking at all the pictures provided, including the ones I provided for you. On page 241, the reason for moving it is because it's not up to code and, but it's been sitting there for 92 years. The entire area was filled years ago with who knows what, and there is a boring and lab results on page 266 to 305,
but how much water is held there during high tide and storms is difficult to ascertain. Water may run down, but it doesn't always go where the engineers predict it will. So moving a building to keep it and keep it in the same flood zone. So the flood zone goes all the way down Water Street, crosses Water Street into the Strawberry Bank. So if you continue to move, if you move the Shaw building from where it is now and you move it, I don't care, 500 feet towards Marcy Street, you're keeping it in the same flood zone. And that doesn't make any sense to me at all. It is stated is being done to maintain the original wharf setup. However, what really is being done is they are moving the Shaw building so a bigger stage and a dressing room area can be built and added between the sheaf and the warehouse and the Shaw building. If the idea of moving the Shaw building is to preserve it, it should be moved to an area outside of that flood zone. And currently that's where the flower gardens is on the right. Just like the homes were moved on the north end to preserve them on the hill. Any activity that includes dig digging into the filled areas of this park opens up the Piscataqua River to runoff of unknown con contamination considering what has been filled in there. There was no regulations at that time and they could end up in the waterway. As a conservation commission, one could justify moving the building to take, out, to, to take the foundation out of the buffer zone. However, since two new structures will be added in that area, it is just creating more additional impervious surface in a high risk flood zone. Please request that the Shaw building be repaired on site or moved to the FEMA floods, out of the FEMA flood zone. Repairing the seawall makes perfect sense and most of the work really seems to be innocuous, but oil booms should be kept on hand or whatever they're called, they're like those little floating things in the water, should be kept on hand in case any of the stones from the seawall fall out and unknown materials start to drain through the area. The seawall is very old from what I can tell and um, we recently did work on our own seawall and when we took out one of the stones, of course two or three other ones decided they would fall um, and so all the stuff that was behind the seawall came forward. So we don't know what's behind the seawall. I know they did some borings but it would be interesting to be at least cautious of if something comes out while they're doing the cleaning or anything, that those booms are available to be used. By the time the Coast Guard gets there, um, whatever it is is gonna be push, pulled into the current of the Piscataqua. One would hope that whatever is in there has been absorbed, but it would make sense to be prepared in case a vein of oil or some other unknown substances blows out. The sea oil repairs could include the removal of grass and some restoration along the interior of the seawall to insist with water uptake and, and erosion. Please ask why the mean confidence intervals were used instead of the 96 random tides. A 50% mis-evaluation seems like a lot when you're talking about water. Thank you for, cons for your consideration of these ideas. Thank you. The reason, I, the reason I did think about oil is I don't know, my husband's aunt died a few years ago and in her 90s and she lived in Puddle Dock most of her life. Um, and she told me that those, there used to be oil things that were stored there during the war. So when you look at the pictures, you see these big containers. I don't know, and I don't know what was in them. I was not able to find that looking through the history of the archives. So that was what made me wonder whether, if that was um, oil, what, how much of that ended up in the ground when they, when they recreated the park. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Questions, comments? Speakers, no speakers. No other speakers, I don't think. Say this again? I said no other speakers, I don't think. There's no other speakers, okay. I, I actually had a question about contamination too. I, I, is that something that you guys have addressed? I assume it. So, so. We, are, we are intimately familiar with everything that's happened on the site. Uh, yeah. We have documentation that um, indicates um, everything that's happened historically on the site. 
um, soil samples have been taken. Uh, we do know what's behind the seawalls. We've done borings. We've done test pits. We've, um, in, in an archaeological way, we know what's in the ground there. We uncovered some, um, you know, some some pieces that I think you may have seen in the paper. Um, I guess the point that I want to make, and you know, with, with just a few words, is 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 we are very aware of what is um, of the park's history um, and what the park needs, and you know, this is not something that hasn't been well thought out and has and and. It's been before the community for a long time. A lot of engineers have studied it. Um, a lot of historians have chimed in. We have blue ribbon committees. Um, various um, 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 city councils have have you know championed the project. Um, there's a lot of knowledge behind the decisions we've made. We're not doing this in a in a, in a whimsical way. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody want to make a motion? Is there any other question? Well, just just to kind of clarify, if there's anything else that you wanted to share in response to the comments, like maybe specifically about the moving of the um, stage and the like future sort of development of the yeah, so that, the, like dressing room. The only or reason we the, the, she she is correct. The the um, the the moving of the stage is not something that's happening in phase one A. We were asked specifically by the commission to speak about the future phases, however, which is why we get into a small discussion about the stage. Um, the, the, the stage design has been revisited many times. It's a controversial piece of the park, whether it's permanent, temporary. There's, there's language in the, um, in the master plan that says specifically what the stage has to be. <clears throat> so we will, get, we will get to the stage design at some point in the future. I look forward to it. But as of right now, um, the stage will stay where it is. Um, it might be part of the next phase, which would be nice if we could if we could get to it because it's such an important part of how the project how the uh, the park functions. But in the meantime, we'll keep patching that little thing and resurfacing it, and propping it up. Mm -hmm. And what is the controversy around it? Just uh, the I, I know at one time there was a <clears throat> it was highly controversial as to whether or not the stage was a permanent structure or a temporary structure. Um, and we've studied both um, scenarios. <clears throat> If it's temporary, um, you know, engineers have to sign off on it every every season. Uh, structural engineers have to come and then we have to store it, take it down. Um, if it's permanent, um, it's more robust. We don't have to take it down, store it, sign off on it every season. But um, that's definitely not a discussion I want to get into now because <laughs> it's so. I mean, there are two camps forming that want it. Some want it permanent, some want it temporary, and we'll we'll get to that. But it sounds like that's part of your yeah. concern. <clears throat> it's not in this phase. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Anybody want to make a motion? Make a motion to recommend approval for the State Wetland Bureau application for Prescott Park for discussion purposes. Thank you. Second. Second. Discussion. I don't know. My head must have been in the sand the whole time this discussion was going on because um, I don't know. There's there's not much about it that I like. I see a lot of trees coming down ultimately. Um, and reconfiguring it when it's just s such a wet area. I understand that we want to get the building moved to a higher area, but how long is that going to be a higher area? Um, mm. And I don't know if suppressing nature is always the best way to handle things. If the whole area wants to fill with water, maybe it should. Yes. Um, particularly for phase 1A, but also kind of spanning all of the phases, um, I think the amount of lawn uh, is, is quite a bit, and I totally understand needing large open areas for seating, like the performance lawn in particular. Um, you know, and maybe Liberty Lawn stays open, but there's a lot of small pocket areas that 
at least on on uh, the imagery we're shown that looks like grass and I think there's a lot of opportunity there to fill in those pocket areas with other types of vegetation really anything is is better than lawn. than lawn um, like the pollinator garden we spoke about um, but you know lots of other types of um, probably low growing vegetation um, and then in particular for phase 1a you know I understand that your reseeding area that might be torn up again in the future um, for the different phases. However, I, I do still think that because it's unclear when the next phases will take place, if there's any opportunity to reseed with something else again besides lawn, um, if it is shrubbery, if it is a pollinator garden, and potentially things that can be moved in the future, that would be, I think, a much better option than just reseeding with lawn. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, <clears throat> I just want to uh, second that point that you're making, uh, Sam, because there are a lot of things that you can plant that people can walk on. And they can put a lawn shield on, and there's still you know, little flowers. You know, there's a lot of rugged things that can be planted, particularly if it's going to be years coming. So its use doesn't preclude it from planting things that can deal with that use. Yeah, I think that's a something. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I think I would just like to add to your point, Barbara, and sort of to what Allison said. I, I agree. I feel like I try to pay attention to what's going on in town, and I this is really the first I've had any real understanding of what the plan is for Prescott Park. So it would be really nice if we could be involved in future phases because this just it feels like a lot and a lot to consider and. I appreciate the ingenuity and all the thought and the years and all of the efforts that you guys have done. Um, but again, for me, I, you know, I just, are we just putting a Band-Aid on something that is gonna be a mess in 20 years again and we're gonna have to be back here having this conversation? That's, that's just my concern about doing all this work and then what's actually coming is this project isn't gonna manage it, so. Thank you. It, I feel kind of torn, right? Because like our role here, right, is to think about sort of the wetland resources, right? And I guess this is like already super developed. And I guess I'm actually not concerned about the additional impact on like nature <laughs> through this project. And but it, but I feel like some of these concerns around do we invest in moving a building and the you know the sort of exact metrics that were used to calculate flood risk feels a little outside of scope, but I, I don't know if that's true or not. I guess I'm looking for like some guidance on whether or not that is something that we're even invited to weigh in on. Or for a recommendation for the wetlands permit? I guess, right? I mean, we have to stick with what they have, what they can use <laughs> if, if we're making recommendations or, mm -hmm. but, but we can, yeah, we can. I mean, yes, there we go. Um, all the inundation maps and everything, I mean, it basically shows the whole area underwater. So, and granted, some of it's like 100 years out or whatever, but where, in 20 years, is there, I, I don't know where it is, there are so many pages, um, is there a, a map that shows what the water level is going to be in 20 years, and are you using a lot of people, a lot of, I think Portsmouth uses a, um, Corps of Army Engineers, but there are other there are other resources for predicting water seawater rise, and they actually are more accurate. They found to be more accurate, but they also show much more sea level rise than Army Corps of Engineers shows. So, can you tell me where it is that shows, like in 25 years, what the water level is going to be? Because all your maps actually have the, like all of Prescott Park underwater. I, I think, if I'm reading them correctly, they're all in blue. 
Can I speak to that? Because there's a lot of uncertainty about where they're going to be exactly in 20 years. Nobody really knows, mm -hmm. but they're going to be higher than they are today. And I guess, I guess I, what I would want to say, just to not just to support the project, but to talk about all the work we've done so far on sea level rise in the downtown and looking at how we're going to be resilient in the future. This is a plan that has taken that into consideration. The reason they've elevated Water Street, the reason they've upgraded the stormwater is really for that reason. It's a developed park, so it's not going to be a pristine natural area, but I think you're right. I feel it takes some responsibility for not bringing this to you. I wasn't that involved in the planning process to get it to the public, but there's been a ton of public outreach and input on this plan. But if you look closer at it, there's quite a bit of planting that isn't there now. There's these bands that go through the park that you can see on there. But I guess what I really want to get at is we, we have an uncertain future for sure, but it's going to include flooding. And we have to learn how to live with that and accommodate it. And this is an area where nobody lives. So think about all the people in the south end that are going to get inundated with floodwaters and they have their homes are going to be impacted. This is a place that can take floodwater. So the idea is this is where the floodwater should go. If you look at the plans in New York City and the parks along mm -hmm. the shore, they're accommodating floodwater so that they protect the residences and the critical infrastructure. This is a first step in that process. And I feel like these guys, you know, they've created a resilience plan. They've tried to address it in the best way we know how. This is one of the first plan that's really addressed climate change and sea level rise. So from that standpoint, in the flooding sense of things, you know, not the, the protection of the natural resource, but in the flooding sense of things, I just want to make a statement that this is sort of the first step. And, you know, we have to work together to try and find a solution and to come up with reasons why they can't do it, I think is easy. but. What's good about it is what I'm seeing, and they're really working hard to elevate some things to keep water out, but also accommodating water by building new infrastructure that goes through it. So I don't know. I guess I just feel like um, I understand they didn't come before the commission and work closer with the commission, and that's something that could be helpful, but that was several years ago in the making. This project's been a long time in the making, and there has been quite a bit of public outreach that people get involved in, but it hasn't been to the commission. So I take responsibility for that and not bringing it to you guys. And I think that's a lesson we can learn on a lot of these projects and we're working on it. But in this case, I just want to talk in terms of the flooding piece. It's sort of a, a first step that someone's taking and, and it's the city and we're trying to be leaders in taking a step to address flooding. So I just want to put that out there that, you know, it might not be perfect in terms of the natural resources, but really their goal is to make it a resilience plan, not to make it a, a natural area, you know, because it's not really a natural area. But um, but there's a lot of natural areas or really cultivated areas in Prescott Park, all these gardens, and they've added to that. So I think that's how they've tried to address it, in my opinion. That's for the long term they've added to for that. For the long term, if you look at the long term plan. Right. And then for the short term flooding, the street elevating and the warehouse, raising the warehouse and putting in stormwater is for the short term so for flooding. I get, I get that idea, and I guess the, it seems like it's kind of mixed signals because. They're raising buildings to keep them dry, I assume. Why, if this is an area that's sort of supposed to be resilient, why are there any, why are they not just moving the buildings elsewhere or something? I, I guess I'm getting mixed signals. Does that, does anybody? Uh, well, they're ra raising them to protect them in the short term. Right, yeah, but it's, it's just step. a short term measure. It might then. be a next step. I mean, the, the long term, you know, we should all move out of the seacoast because in 150 years, it's going to be eight right. to 10 well. feet, you know, so. <laughs> So this is this is my point is that yeah, it's no, not easy. Okay. It's not easy. We have a flooding situation that we're trying to deal with, and I think this is a. a I just need path, it to know. I wanted potential to potential path forward. Maybe it's not the right one, but in my opinion, it's it's at least someone trying to do yeah. something. You know? I just needed the logic to get sort of smoothed yeah. out. So it's yeah. it's a temporary move. The building thing is. Well, I mean, I mean, in the in, in the, the in the hundred year time yeah. scale, maybe. Or yeah. even maybe less, but yeah, yeah. okay. I right. think the Shafe Warehouse is a great example of what you just said. It was moved to that location from Mechanic Street. Right. And it was actually put at the proper elevation when they moved it. That's the elevation we're putting Shaw at. Is the, the floor levels are going to be the same, the first floor levels. Um, and we've been able to enjoy it for another 50 years and, and, and beyond now. So that's a great example. And who knows what, what the Shafe and Shaw are going to have to deal with 100 years from now. But right. we're buying time. Yeah, that's that's yeah. that's kind of my point. It's, a, okay. it's an effort to try to yep. address this. We, you know. So, um, I think we have a motion, and I don't think there's any conditions on it at this point. I didn't have any. No. Um, do you guys want any conditions in case I know it's for discussion purposes? But 
I would like two conditions at least. That they plant something other than grass seed on the open soil areas. And that they develop a maintenance plan for the pervious areas of the park. You right with that? I'm okay because, with that, yep. Okay. So first and second did with two conditions. And what was the second one? Provide pervious areas? Uh, a maintenance, maintenance plan. Areas. Provide a maintenance plan. For the pervious area. And I, I just want to say that we, I, I can't emphasize enough how much we really want to participate in input from now on because um, it can be really exciting. And um, so I don't know if we want to, any other discussion or anything from anybody? All those in favor and opposed? Motion passes with those recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is a work session, 89 Sparhawk Street. Anybody so just here? Just to remind you guys, you have to be here at, out of here at 5.30. Yep. Okay. Somebody here to speak to that? Yeah, they're outside. We doing Sparhawk? Five oh six. Five oh six. Five. Yeah, it's five oh six. Five oh six. Five. Oh, yeah, that's right. Somebody coming in at five thirty. I just hit the bookmark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's at five oh six. Okay. I wasn't sure what we were waiting Sorry, for if they wanted to get up the store. Are you guys ready? Yes. Okay. Oh. You're waiting for Peter, right, to put the... Okay, sorry. I wasn't no. sure where, where we were at there. Thank you. I'm uh, Steve Riker from Mamba Engineering. I'm here today uh, representing uh, Jonathan and Lisa Morse. They own property at 89 Sparhawk Street. Uh, this is... Uh, we've submitted materials uh, for a work session here. We're looking uh, for this commission to uh, provide us with some comments before we proceed with uh, a more full design. Um, we've been working on this project for, for a few months now uh, with these property owners. Uh, the project team consists of uh, myself and John Shagnon from AMBA Engineering, Robbie Woodburn from Woodburn & Company, uh, Landscape Architects, and Jen Ramsey from Soma Studios here in Portsmouth as the, uh, the architectural uh, component of the project. Um, Perfect. Peter's got the existing conditions plan up. So this is the lot here. There we go. It's an existing uh, residential structure located here. Uh, driveway off from Sparhawk Street is here. Uh, there's a patio in the rear of the house. Uh, there's also a deck right here in the rear of the house. Um, further to the North is a uh, tidal wetland uh, located here, and then there's also a freshwater wetland uh, that extends <coughs> in this direction um, on the lot. The result is we have a, uh, for DES purposes, we have a tidal buffer zone that's right here, this line, and we have a City of Portsmouth 100-foot uh, wetland buffer line that is right here. And you can see that wetland buffer line right now currently goes through the rear of the home uh, the project is uh, to construct an addition onto this house, uh, a garage addition, and Peter, if you could forward to the next sheet, uh, sheets, well, actually, this is the demolition plan, so let me talk about that first. Uh, the existing patio will be removed. 
Uh, there's a, a granite walkway or a stone walker walkway right here that will also be removed as well as there's a series of retaining walls on this property. Uh, they are the dark lines that you see here. All those retaining walls will also be removed. The next sheet shows the proposed addition, which would be located right here. As you can see, the wetland buffer would go right through the middle of the addition, so to speak. Uh, a patio here, um, removing the patio that exists on the lot now and trying to get it outside the 100-foot uh, tidal buffer zone for DES purposes was one of our goals, move it further away from the resource. Uh, the deck would remain on the home and the garage addition would go right here. It is a three-story garage. Are we calling it a three-story? No, it's two. It's two. It's a two-story garage. Um, new driveway location in front of the garage that lines up with the garage bays. Uh, this last bay over here is more of a storage bay. Um, we haven't designed any stormwater control yet. We will be doing that. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that we do not show on our plan set is the property owners installed a landscape area back here, uh, which is planted with native shrubs. I believe they are silky dogwood. Uh, looks very nice. They've done that on their own. Um, but we'd be looking to do a, a full stormwater design to handle, control, and treat stormwater uh, for this project. Uh, after this meeting, uh, we would come back with a, with a stormwater design later. Um, a couple other things I wanted to point out. There's a proposed walkway right here, as well as a set of stairs. Again, those are those are uh, accessory structures uh, that provide foot access. Uh, they are outside of the buffer, but they are part of the project. In the packet that you have is uh, two pages of architectural elevations that show the proposed addition. And there is also a photo log in there that shows some photos of the site and I believe we are lined up to have a site walk here in January I think on January 4th so I'm assuming there'll be some more some more questions then and also being able to see the site I think will help as well thank you thanks questions yes Allison um, well you're you're doubling the amount of impervious surface area on the property uh, at least according to your your schedule here. And um, that garage and storage area is really very large. And I would think that if you were going to put something on this property, you'd understand that the buffer area is there for a reason and that um, making something this large in the buffer, I just think it's, it's just too big. Um, you need to shrink the size of the garage and storage area. That's my personal feeling. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, can you tell me what the, um, when you're looking at that plan, the, and say you're, you're on Sparhawk Street looking at the house, what is the, um, the dimension, how many feet from the, building setback to the wall of the existing house is on that side and I'm going to ask you what it is on the other side just like where you're um, where the addition is going so I basically I'd like to see I'd like to know what the the dimensions are um, if you have them because I couldn't figure out where they are and I'm just going to take a tape measure out um, to the yard but I didn't have time so um, let me just make sure um that I'm understanding you correctly. Are you talking about the building setback uh, from, the the, front, from the front? The dimension from the building setback to the actual wall. In other words, if you were going to put an addition but put it on the other side, how much room do you have to work with as opposed to keeping it on the right side? Just So I, I'd basically like to know the dimensions on each side of the house to the side setbacks. Gotcha. Okay. Yep, let me grab a scale. Okay. Do 
just check this in a couple spots. <clears throat> So on the left side, there is about 34 feet. 34 feet. Okay. And there it is. And on the right side, there is 48 feet. Okay. Um, From the existing home. Right. Gotcha. Um, Good. The proposed driveway, um, the same. Um, graphic used for the proposed driveway is also what's in front of between the street and that storage area uh, is that what is that going sure. to be I'll have um, Jen address that okay. you? and She's are they the same material are you planning on it being the same material yes so why is there paving in front of a storage area is it really going to be like a th is it sort of like a Almost a three-car garage. Yeah, I'll have I'll have Jen okay. answer that question. All right, I figured I'd just throw the questions yep. out. Well. Yep. Um, it can be a three-car garage. They do intend to use that third bay for kayaks, um, longboard surfboards, things that have length to them. Uh, they have a small sports car which can fit in that that third bay. Um, and the reason that we're trying to make it functional for both those attributes is because um, a lot of cars park on the street, on that very narrow street on both sides. And so this is a family of five. And if they can get cars off the road more often than not, it's actually a benefit to the neighborhood, which is something that everyone kind of agrees with. So it, it would fit a small car. The bays themselves are not, the, the actual garage bays themselves are very conservatively sized for the, the reasons I'm sure you're all interested in knowing. And we tried to keep this very conservative. They're not extra deep. There isn't room for a workbench in the back. Um, trash, recycling, don't have a space to fit when their car is going to be in there. So we were trying to be thoughtful in all of those different um, respects. Can you? But it's like everyday living, basically. Um, can you just introduce your name just for Sorry, the yes. Jennifer Ramsey with Soma Studios on behalf of the applicant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, is there, okay, well, anyway, um, uh, my next question is, this drawing has, as you're looking at the house, it has on the left side, it has the new, that big new building, the behemoth building, uh, that out, it's got that, um, wall line. The neighbor on the other side, you do not have that. And that house is extremely close to, I mean, I think their fence might be, I don't, the property lines didn't sort of seem <coughs> to match up with where the actual, I mean, mm -hmm. where the supposed ones are versus where the actual seem to be. Mm -hmm. um, can you, can you discuss one, you know, how close that house is? Because these, these drawings I find are quite deceptive compared to being yeah. on site. Yeah. Um, I might defer back to, to Steve on that. Um, you're implying that their fence may be on our land. Is that what you're? Well, I don't know. Is that, what's that little tell. line? Is that the fence line that's actually inside their property line? That is this line yeah. here. So yeah. the, is the neighbor's fence, fence? And how close is yeah. that, is the neighbor's um, house to, um, to that property line? The neighbor's house is seven feet from the property line? Seven feet? Yep. Okay. And, and there's the, the fence is, the fence, uh, there's a little bit of an angle there, but the fence is about three feet off the line <clears throat> onto, onto this property. Yeah. Yep. And are you going to be changing that or leaving nope. it as is? Oh, there's no change to that. And seven feet. Okay. Um, did you guys think about putting anything on the other side of the house, you know, closer to the, the big blue building? Um, because that's not in the buffer, you know, most of that would be outside the buffer zone. 
I mean, I know you've probably got a porch and all that, but. Um. We, we did look at all the opportunities to achieve the goals of what the, what the client was looking for. Um, the existing home, as it's currently laid out, this side of the home is where the mudroom is, the laundry, the kitchen. Right. So perceptibly, a garage on that side makes more sense. Furthermore, if we put the garage on the other side, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell and perhaps maybe easier to tell when you're on site. The existing original home, which sits right on the street, it's in, it's in you yeah. know. All those the, houses are right on right. the street. And so the so it's actually um, that original main house is more like a story and a half than two stories. So the windows on the left hand side, on the side you're inquiring about, mm -hmm. on the second floor, those are bedrooms. Um, there's only two of them and the windows are very, very low to the 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 the, um, the, the uh, floor basically. The floor, right. So if we were to put the garage there, we would basically eliminate our life safety egress and we would abandon two bedrooms in a four bedroom home. So it was mm -hmm. really about not changing um, the current layout of the home. This home did go through a renovation relatively recently with the addition on the back and so there's been work done to make improvements to the structure as it is and preserve it. So going in there and trying to turn the whole thing on its head really felt like a lot more egregious in many, many ways. There's also mechanicals on that side of the lot adjacent to the home. Those have to be relocated. So it was um, <laughs> a lot of things were at play basically when we were laying this out. Um, if you, the building is the new the addition is its plans is way way into the buffer i mean as allison said half of it's in the yeah. buffer mm -hmm. um uh and i know you're working with the street setbacks but all the houses there are right up on the street mm -hmm. i'm wondering why you didn't just move it forward mm -hmm. so then it stays out of the wetlands more Sure. Um, if not completely. We were trying to maintain some driveway before you get into the garage for mm -hmm. ease and safety with backing out and also for the ability to put cars in the driveway as well as in the garage in a case that it would, you know, should it come up. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very valid point to push it right up closer. Um, but again, I think there was certainly some safety concerns with backing, backing onto that narrow street. Mm -hmm. um, across the street is a retaining wall and I know I've been in their driveway before and even my car backing up was a little bit treacherous yeah the whole thing it's, it's yeah so. it's a bit of a mess yeah <laughs> so um but what if what if you put like the storage over onto the other side of the building the uh, of the house i mean i know because that would be lower right right right, right. It, it would be lower right and so if we were trying to do anything anyway, with car we'd have to yeah. raise it I'm up just and retain throwing it. that out yeah and sure absolutely. those are all my questions mm -hmm. thanks brian. Yeah. sorry yeah brian no that's a good that's a good segue because i had the same thought or question there is it true um I don't know if I consume this property. Is there not a garage on the property today? Just there's a no with? garage, just a little crushed stone parking area. So, just to make sure I understand it, mm -hmm. in this ad, it adds basically three garage spots or two plus one. Yeah. And also adds a driveway, right? So a substantial amount of parking space, it, and it, as a result, mm -hmm. all of that pushes it into the zone. I just wanted to make sure that I understood that was the substantial <laughs> different from. That would, yes, so it's two, it's two standard spaces and one that's shallower because we've recessed that back a right. little bit more for some massing and there is driveways in front of all three. Um, all of the driveway space, per Robbie was saying, could be um, made to be pervious. The patios could be made to be pervious as well, going back to one of the earlier so, questions. Mm -hmm. So even, even the three car garage, if it were pulled back mm -hmm. closer to the street, mm -hmm would be a substantial add to the property versus today. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Other questions, <coughs> other commissioners? No. I had a question. Um, the, the impervious surface area table, is there one that has the buffer comparison? I think this is just total, right? This is total. <clears throat> That's is correct. Is there one yep, that shows just total. A comparison impervious surface in the buffer versus? Yeah, we would. We would come back with one that has just the buffer. That'd be great. If that's yeah. what you want. Thank you. Um, also, just wanted to address that the front setback, the building setback, it's tough to see, but there's a dotted line, and it's right there. So yeah. pushing, pushing the structure more towards the street certainly gets more of the structure out of the buffer, but it would require a variance. From the zoning board. Understood. Well, yes, it's sort of like <laughs> we're 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 trying to we're trying to balance that as well. And I might just um, add to your point earlier. Um, currently, they can park two cars there. So if we were to. 
go with the three-car garage, pull it forward so we can't park any in a driveway. They'd only be gaining one additional space, basically. There'd just be three covered spaces, no outside. Sure. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Samantha? Um, I would just like to ask when we uh, come before you for our site walk, if things could be staked out, um, you know, exactly where the corners are of this new proposed area, as well as um, where you're potentially planning on doing more plantings. Um, I know you said the applicant has plantings there already. Obviously, we can't really see them on or don't see them on the uh, on the plan, so we'll see them in person. But um, putting those on future plans and then any opportunity to enhance the buffer would be great. And sh kind of staking that out also in the field is just really helpful for us when we get out there. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. So we could. Um, oh. We could do um, well these five corners of the structure. Yeah, and I think um, also the patio, the new where the new patio yep. is. Yeah, we'll do uh, we'll do this corner uh, in this corner as well, and then the patio itself too. Yeah, yep. it just helps us get an idea of like visually how close mm -hmm. you are to uh, the wetland. Anything else? I have another question. Real, real quick. Please. Sorry. This is a quick one. It's a dimension question. You guys um, try to, I get, I'm getting word from the producer, but they're not hearing it very well. If you could just try to speak closer to your mic. Somewhere. I can't find it now, but I think I saw it somewhere. But could you just tell me how long, um, what's the width of, what's the, what are the dimensions of the new garage slash home theater slash family room? Um, in terms of um, well, okay. footprint. So, the, so um, I think the best way, because we basically taken some of this addition and, well, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. What, part of what's existing and part of what is new is kind of, all, is kind of overlaps on itself a bit. So the actual, from the point of the existing face of the building, um, we are, let's see, we're like, we're 30 feet the two, and then it's 40 feet for the three bays. So say mm -hmm. 40 feet from the further, because the current house jogs several times. There's areas yeah. where there's no foundation. So from that furthest um, wall out, yeah. does that make sense? And yeah. well, I think when it's staked, it'll be more I saw evident. it somewhere. Yeah, yeah I it's saw a bit it, of a dimension somewhere. I just yes. couldn't find the drawing yeah. again, yeah. and I figured you could just, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I knew I saw it. Somewhere. But from the standpoint of the size of these garage, the garage bays themselves, you know, it's a two, the two car, let's say it's 26 wide and only 24 deep. So it's a very conservatively sized garage by sure, what today, today's standards that people are building. Which is why we put the cars in there as well, so you could see what their cars would be like inside that, that bay. Oh, yes, Sam. Um, I would just like to reiterate um, what Allison said at the very beginning. Like, it, you are saying it's conservatively sized by you know, present day standards. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's still a three car garage and mm -hmm. it's still in an area that is a very small parcel. You're right in a very sensitive area. Um, and, and to Brian's point, you know, moving it up close to the road <coughs> does require a variance, mm -hmm. but you also are requiring conditional use permit here. So sure. yeah. kind of looking at both options, mm -hmm. um, that would pull it quite a bit out of the buffer and allowing you still to get that that mm -hmm. size you're looking mm -hmm. for sure um so i think that should be something that you you do look into for mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. yeah great okay are we good on questions are you guys good we'll see you in january at the yes. site visit sounds great thank you thank you okay thank you yeah. so much thank you appreciate it thanks for waiting <clears throat> So the next and last items we have are other business. We already welcome the new members. Um, Kate, I think you were going to do a brief, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> update on the wetland boundary markers that we have here. Oh, yeah. People have them. We have them, so. Mm -hmm. cool. So I passed out four or five of them, but that's what we got from um, the Massachusetts company that we ordered from. And so the plan is, so those costs, we got 250 pieces ordered, and I think at cost they were a buck 90 a piece, and we are going to be selling them out of the planning department to the applicants for $5 a piece. And so 
sort of the, the rule here is that in the ordinance it says that applicants must show uh, where they will be placing well and boundary marker signs on their plans, which a lot of applicants don't do currently. So we're going to try and make it um, onto every staff memo as a recommendation or as a stipulation that um, plans must show where they were going to be putting well and boundary marker signs as they're coming in. Um, and so sort of our role will be to sort of see on the plan where those will be and if they haven't shown it on the plan um, we're not allowed to really pinpoint where exactly we would like to see it but we can give them a general sort of recommendation according to the legal department um, where we would like to see it sort of um, placed on a tree or sort of outside your wetland buffer area or in a place that leads towards um, a sensitive area but um, that's sort of what we're allowed to do and we are allowed to suggest that they purchase from us in the planning department upstairs or if they would like to purchase wetland boundary marker signs from another company um, we are allowed to review that and reject it if we don't like it yeah we, we've sort of vacillated regarding where we wanted those signs do we want them at the edge of the buffer do we want them at the edge of wet where, where do we want them and sometimes it really depends on the property itself I mean sometimes it makes sense to go a little bit further than than the buffer yeah or the wetland and other times you need to mark where that buffer is so yeah you know, when they ask us it's kind of hard to say it might be a more site-by-site -site, like recommendation yeah. of where we can maybe push where we would like to see it um, and I think that's also going to be something that we're going to talk about with maybe potential future amendment change or zoning amendment changes trying to add in with that section of the wetland boundary markers where we'd like to see it like before I mentioned a couple weeks ago or months ago <clears throat> Exeter has it in their ordinance is every 50 feet on the weapon wetland buffer delineation so maybe that's something or something similar to that something we can talk about in the future for changes if we're thinking of going that route thank you Jess uh, just uh, well first of all they look awesome you did a yeah, great job great. So all, all this <laughs> well done <laughs> Make it nice work um, just sort of a, a, I don't know if this is an appropriate question but the proceeds from these what's the great plan question. for that very appropriate question <laughs> so um, Isaac and I have figured it out with the finance department so at first there's you might already know so annually in the planning department there is a budget for the Conservation Commission to do um, trainings and like things like that in conferences that's I believe either 1600 or 1800 a year and so at first all those proceeds will go into that budget and at the end of every year that budget gets rolled into the overall conservation fund for um, purchasing properties and things like that so it'll just keep rolling into the fund Why don't you charge Thank ten dollars <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, $5 is pretty good. <laughs> I think it's Each one, yeah. making some money back. But um, I think also this is sort of our test run. So we only ordered 250. So the idea is if we think it's not enough or if we think it's too much or we want to change the design in the future, we can see how it goes and if property owners are okay with this and really think it's a positive thing to do so we can sort of adapt as we go along. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Kate. Thank it's great. Thank you. Awesome. So look great. Um, we'll be collecting those at the end, just so <laughs> oh, right. we can keep them. Um, I have two two other announcements. I think one really quickly. Tomorrow night, I'm going to talk or read the letter at the planning board meeting for the CIP request. And if anybody else wants to go, six o'clock, right? Starts at six. Yeah, yeah it's probably. They'll will. do. Uh, every department is going to present, and I think they'll take public comment after that. Right after that. Okay. So anybody else wants interested in chiming in or whatever? So uh, it's not after all the um, applicants have been heard. It's before the applicants yeah. are heard. Yeah, it's in, in advance of the meeting. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then the other one is you got this flyer here. Peter and I have been working on this um, workshop. That's the Flood Smart Portsmouth. With um, let's see. Cooperative uh, Extension and Sea Grant. Sea Grant, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. Um, and we're going to get this out to all the different boards and land use planning um, and also staff and trying to get a representative at least one person from each board um, so they'll appoint somebody but it would be great whoever wants to go this is free and it's virtual and, and it's virtual yeah it should be really good 
Peter's going to be presenting. The, uh, a detailed agenda will come out in the next couple of weeks. But um, yeah, this is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <clears throat> Give us some really good tools and opportunity can I, to. Can I make a suggestion for the agenda? Because it's relevant to this particular board. But it'd be really interesting to see what some of the projections are for the outdoor pool, you know, the Pierce Island pool. I'd be really interested in seeing what okay. we're using for that measurement because <clears throat> in this part of the present yeah, presentation. We already have that on plan, so we yeah. probably could do something with like that. Yeah. So, and I, I just. To show that. And then. Uh, one last thing is on um, the regulations and looking at that is um, I did meet with the, um, the chair of the planning board the other day, but uh, the next steps really include getting in touch with the city council and putting a recommendation in to make changes to the C CUP and then, um, and then working as a group to come up with what we have. So maybe doing a non-public kind of couple of members giving feedback, right? A couple uh, members could do like a study group and then bring it to a work session with the whole commission and then meet with the planning board is what we talked about this morning. Right. So within the next few months, we'll be working on that. Um, but if you, I, for next steps, I mean, giving Samantha. Well, I know Samantha spearheaded it, so I guess her and two other members could do it. Um, My study group. Or if two study groups wanted to start, they could do it separately. Then everybody yeah, yeah. could be in the work session. But. So what are we looking at? What do you mean a study group? So rather than a quorum, rather than having a, pub, a meeting, you'd require a public meeting if four members got together. If only three members got together, you could talk about it and then bring that to everybody in a public forum. So, you know, kind of talk about where areas are that you want to make changes. It doesn't have to be very detailed, but these are the things that we run into. These are the changes we'd like to see. Then bring that to the whole commission. And then from that, if the city council supports it, then take it um, and meet with the planning board, see what they want to change together, and then together, um, probably hire a consultant to write actually or, or actual ordinances that we can also review and then the city council ultimately has to approve it with the planning board weighing in. Okay. And we just really quickly need to do a vote to make a recommendation to the city council, right? You would say? Oh, that would be good. Yeah. You don't have to, I mean, yeah, if it's a consensus, but I think. Yeah. Yeah. So to do this, so everybody. So the city council, the, the vote would be the, the city group? council. Um, Give you the go ahead to start working on changes to the wetland ordinance in the zoning ordinance, wetland section of the zoning ordinance. So, do we have to vote on no. to approach them? Just yeah, to send it, yeah, just to, just and to make they have to let us look at it. Is that sort of well, they're they're because they they finally adopt the zoning ordinance. Yes. So, the idea is that if they're going to adopt the zoning ordinance, they're going to want to adopt things that they care about. So, if they don't want to see changes to the wetland ordinance, then it wouldn't make sense to do all that work behind the scenes. So it's kind of laying out for them that you're going to want to tackle this project mm -hmm. just to get their support in initially. So then you can do the work and then you okay. don't have to go back and say, oh, you don't want to do that, um, you know. Okay. So all those in favor of making a recommendation to the city council for regulation uh, changes? Shoot. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. And why oh, get rid of that? Motion to adjourn? Oh, right. Unless there's anybody else? <laughs> oh, well. Mm -hmm. Okay. No motion. Any motion? motion to adjourn. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. <laughs> All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Sorry.